So thank you to Jill and Aruna and everybody else who was associated with the organization of the, of the conference. So I begin with uh, two perspectives offered by Europeans and Iran, bracketing 1863 and 1930, that reflect typical notions on the Persianate visual arts and their practice. The first text is written by Monsieur le Comte Julien de Rochechouart in Iran from 1863. In a chapter on boarding, bookbinding, and painting, he begins, the Persians have no idea about painting as we think of it. And what's more, they don't understand it. Persian rulers have been heard speaking many times about the value we attach to this art and have requested paintings and sent students to study in Rome. But the paintings that they bring them are loathsome and the students sent to Europe learn nothing and return saying to explain their ignorance that we have nothing in painting that's remarkable and that the last sweeper of the streets of Tehran knows better how to hold a brush than Raphael or Titian. Although the seated Madonna has found grace before Raphael and Titian, the Persian artist Persianized it before reproducing it. At first, she was not quite so decollete. Then changed the palette. It takes a lot of goodwill to identify the model. Further on, and I can't resist reading the French, because it's much more obnoxious than the French, <laughs> he writes, Quant aux peintures que les Persans produisent eux-mêmes, cette affaire grincer les dents. Non seulement ils ignorant les principes de la perspective et du dessin, non seulement leurs couleurs sont mauvaises et leurs méthodes de brosse sont détestables, mais on ne peut s'expliquer comment un peuple dont le goût est si délicat dans certains cas et qui possède un si haut degré de la science de couleur peut consentir à regarder de pareils horaires. Further on, de Rochechouart concludes that the Persians are ornamentalists, nothing more, this is all in quotations, and that their painting is an utterly industrial art form, that their art of illumination is in decline, the taste for it absent from most Persian artists, that artists have as their models images of Lorraine that garnish the shop windows of wig makers in our village stores, or lithographs that decorate the rooms in taverns, Asia, Africa, Nina, Matilda's smile, a fire in the new world, and even worse, lewd engravings of the sort only sold in the back stores of certain neighborhoods. And in that, and that in the Orient, the artist is a tradesman or a worker. One does not buy his works for their intrinsic merit, but only because one needs them. The Rosh Hashuar applies these assessments equally to artworks that are produced for the court and those on the open market in the bazaar. In the second perspective from 1930, Robert Byron records his encounter with the Persian painter Muzaffar in Isfahan. Byron writes, Muzaffar takes one back to the days before artistic temperament when artists did as they were told. He comes from generations of painters and has inherited their craftsman's attitude. In fact, he started by decorating pen boxes. A request follows. Byron asks Muzaffar to make his portrait. Muzaffar asks Byron for a photograph from which to copy. Byron refuses, explaining that the purpose in giving him the commission was to see if he could draw from life. The experiment yielded a portrait, not a likeness, quite in the Persian style. But Byron had to design the picture, say how the head must be spaced on the paper, and decide if the background should be plain or enriched. At the end of the story, Byron remarks that Muzaffar worked in two manners, Persian and European, and that the miniatures he had seen done after photographs were simply photographs themselves, only tinted. Byron fully expects to be asked for a photograph, but declines to give him one, hoping instead for an image made through Muzaffar's traditional Persian manner. The image not only involved a portrait likeness, uh, sorry, a portrait aesthetic of the not likeness, but a hierarchy of production that enlists Byron in the process as well as Muzaffar's pupils who do the backgrounds and borders from a repertory of traditional patterns. These opinions and misprisions 
are not at all unusual in the long history of reception of Persian aid arts in the West, but happen to coincide temporarily with the growth of collecting Islamic art and the emergence of the discipline of art history. More troubling is that ideas voiced by de Rochechouart and Byron still find their echoes uh, stretching back to a formative discourse um, that was emergent in the early 1900s, and we still find echoes of what they had said in an academic discourse today. In different ways, de Rochechouart and Byron addressed the aesthetics, practices, and production of Persianate painting of the era of the Qajar dynastic rule to draw contrasts between its norms and those of Europe. But they also confront the evident intersections between the practice of Qajar painting and new technologies of mechanical image reproduction, ranging from the lithograph to the chromolithograph and the photograph. One of the key questions framed by both writers might be understood to turn on artistic authenticity and tradition an Iranian exposure from circa 1600 onwards to post-Renaissance European paintings and prints, but only to detrimental results as judged against the standard of European norms. Many have identified the sequence of exchanges as the root cause that brought about the demise of traditional Persianate painting, its steady erosion and decline over 300 years. From the perspective of a decline model, the advent of lithography and photography and their assimilation into Qajar artistic production could only have precipitated a deeper sense of loss and nostalgia for an irrecoverable art of the native Persian past. Another viewpoint frames the Qajar artist's choice as a problem of modernity and as an emerging discourse tends to fo focus on photography. For example, even though Iranians quickly embraced the daguerreotype and later photographic processes, including wet collodion, Ali Behdad accepts Europe's ownership of the medium to position Qajar photographers as co-opted agents who could only reproduce a way of seeing and showing the East and Western terms. Such was the power of Orientalism that native Persian photography reproduced Orientalist aesthetic values and ideological assumptions. The watercolor on the left is taken by Behdad as evidence of the artist's displacement by photography, which would be privileged over painting from the 1850s onwards. It's a rather naive reading of the image. Both viewpoints turn around the perspective of a perceived rupture, seen in either a negative or a positive light. The breaking of tradition, instantiated by growing exposure to European culture, and technology on the eve of the colonial era. What I find striking is that neither one of these views is grounded in a systematic study of the range of visual materials, which indicate more complex intersections and imbrications of media, as well as their remediation. Qajar artists of the mid to late 1800s were hardly troubled by photography. Did 19th century Iranians perceive lithography and photography as the burden that they would later become in 20th century scholarship? How did their assimilation into painting occur? And what can we make of the reception through the medium of painting? Another crucial question concerns the idea that photography was regarded as the epitome of modernity and presented a double challenge to the East. Photography held a reproductive potential, and it seemed to naturalize pictorial perspective reconstructions and optically naturalist modes of representation. Attending to these questions requires that three topics be addressed, though of course only briefly today. First, the advent of photography in Iran, it's a kind of backstory. Second, the mediation of lithography and photography and painting. And third, the perspective of a longer history and how it might alter our understanding of Qajar artistic practice. What I want to suggest is that the Qajar reception of mechanically produced and reproducible images can be understood as yet another remediation, another assimilation of a reproductive technology, and hence can equally be understood as a continuity and not as an instantiation of rupture. Knowledge of photography and its requisite technology were quickly made available to the royal court in Iran and disseminated from it. 
It was only a few years after the official presentation of the daguerreotype to the French Académie des Sciences in 1839 that the practice spread to Persia. One of the earliest known daguerreotypes to be made in Iran is a self-portrait on the right by Qajar Prince Malik Qasim Mirza. Some photographic apparatus arrived in the 1840s through gifts made to the Qajar ruler Muhammad Shah by um, Queen Victoria of England and Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. Monsieur Jules Richard was invited to the Qajar court in 1844 to explain the operations and principles of photographic equipment and to demonstrate their use, and many Europeans followed. While Europeans resident in Iran played a critical role in disseminating and propagating knowledge of photography, its support by members of the royal house led in turn to the training of Persians in the medium. Two of the best known Qajars to practice photography were Malik Qasim Mirza, son of the Qajar ruler Fat Ali Shah and Nasir Adin Shah shown at the center. As early as 1850, uh, Malik Qasim Mirza gave an album of photographs to his nephew, Nasir Adin Shah. Nasir Adin Shah's photographs assembled into albums comprising thousands of images and a tiny fraction of them have been um, investigated record the activities of the court and portray the inhabitants of its most private areas, including the ladies in the harem. He also commissioned photographers to document the architectural heritage of Persia and aspects of daily life, and went on to devote a portion of the palace to the house of photography, the Akas Khane, and also created the office of official court photographer, uh, the Akas Bashi. One of the most important sites for photography was the Dar al Fanun, Iran's first polytechnic established in 1851. The institution was initially conceived as an instrument to develop Western uh, knowledge of Western sciences and military training and to modernize Iran through internal reform. But by the 1860s, the curriculum adjusted its emphasis towards non-military subjects to include photography, painting, and music. Mariam Iktiar notes that the shift corresponded to Nasser ad uh, dis disillusionment with reform and that it was symptomatic of his reversion to a, quote, patrimonial mode of monarchy. Photography uh, was added to the curriculum in 1860 and first located in the Department of Chemistry uh, and then painting was established in 1861. Though there's more to be learned about the pedagogy of painting at Dar al Fanun, students learned about European painting and lithography and studied directly from photographic models, paintings, sculptures, and engravings of works by European artists. Ektiar interprets the goal as one of creating, quote, works that would measure up to the European standards of realism, perspective, chiaroscuro, and modeling. One of the chief artists of the time, Abul Hassan Ghafari, later honored with the title Sani al-Mulk, uh, craftsman of the kingdom, trained in the West and upon his return held the position of chief editor of the state newspaper and also oversaw Tehran's Majma al-Dar al-Sanoi, which was an arts and crafts center founded in 1852 by Nasr Shah's prime minister and he also supervised a project uh, to produce an illustrated six-volume Persian translation of the Thousand and One Nights. As Iktiar argues, the curriculum de developed by Abul Hassan for the Dar al-Fanun was adapted to Persian systems of artistic pedagogy because it excluded life drawing, anatomy, geometry, and art theory. Iktiar also observes that the principle of learning through imitation and the value attached to replication were similar in the art modern context of the Dar al Fanun and the craft traditional context of the Majma al Dar al Sinai. Although there was a division between institutional environments, artistic practices remained constant uh, across them. Useful though they are, these observations tend to overlook the formal aspects of Qajar painting as visual manifestations and reproduce in an uncritical way a recurring theme of contemporary writing, viz. that Qajar artists attempted to, uh, to assimilate European pictorial modes 
on their terms. These observations give little emphasis to a crucial point, that photography's importance for painting lay in its convenience as a model, and that as an image of a referent, the photograph already subjected its referent to a process of mediation. So though photography structured a uh, new form of subjectivity between viewer and object, this was not carried over to the artistic practices that in turn led to the production of paintings. Before turning to examples of painting from 1850 to 1900, it's worth providing some reactions to photography recorded in Persian sources. Several writers in photography introduced the medium as a kind of painting and uh, spoke of it in terms defined through painting. Thus, the court Itimada Sultana writes in his Ma'athar Fa'al Athar, 1889 to 90, since photography was discovered, it's been of great service to the art of design. The art of landscape rendering, of portraiture, of light and shade, and the use of the laws of perspective, as well as other aspects of this technique. All have found their originality and have been perfected. In his journal, Nasir Adin Shah writes that photography is a reflection and imprint of images of objects on external surfaces, and notes its usefulness as a device in the demonstration of the science of perspective. These remarks convey the belief that photography naturalized perspective. It seemed to confirm the optical and perceptual truth of post-Renaissance painting. But more curiously, one also senses that the photographic medium was a more effective transmitter of lessons in post-Renaissance pictorial conventions than European paintings or direct study from life. Photography allowed Qajar artists to see in a way that they could apparently not by direct vision or through pictorial models. Other comments made by contemporaries, especially Haji Mola Hadi Sabzavari, dealt with philosophical questions that issued from the capacity of a man-made apparatus, mechanical apparatus, to produce images on paper. As Stephen Vernois has observed, theologians and jurists argued that a photographer was not rivaling God in the creative act because a photograph was brought about by the agency of the sun and was the result of divine activity, contrasting a passive reflection against an active creation. So what if the practice of painting at this time? Current assessments of Qajar art are undecided. Some accounts suggest the slow eclipse of painting in the face of photography, while others argue for the continuity of painting at the court and in other contexts. The position of royal painter, Nakash Bashi, continued under Nasir Adin Shah, even when interest in photography intensified. The royal painter's mandate included oversight of the royal workshops and the guilds in the city's bazaar, as well as instructing the ruler in painting. Painting continued to be practiced in a variety of formats, venues, and media, from life-sized panel oil paintings to enamels, lacquered objects, miniature paintings, and books, though the rupture paradigm tends to obfuscate this continuity in practice. A brief survey of pedagogy in the Dar al Fanun pointed to the close intersection of painting, photography, and lithography from 1850 onwards. The direct use of photographs is verbally attested, and a few examples uh, that can be paired, such as the portrait of Nasir Adin Shah in the salt print and in the watercolor. It's clear that we cannot take the watercolor photograph and cannot treat it as, quote, simply a tinted photograph, as Byron was inclined to think about paintings. Looking at the watercolor leaves me questioning how the photograph could have imparted lessons in chiaroscuro, while the tight frame removes the issue of the perspectival model. Artistic competence doesn't explain away this issue either, as several other examples of painting attest. The photograph supplied the outline of a figure, possible compositional items, a chair but not a backdrop, and a skein of illuminated and shaded passages. The translation toward a painting required not only an imagined palette and invention of pattern, 
but also a choice of which tonal passages to mimic, which ones to invent, and which ones to ignore. Another example, a portrait of Hussein Ali Khan Mu'ayyir al-Mamalik, dated in 1853-4, is signed by the court painter Abul Hassan Ghafari. The painted image portrays an individual in a shallow, tipped-up pictorial space and remediates aesthetic aspects of the photograph. It resembles the closely framed Qajar photographic studio portraits that I just showed you. A figure dominates the composition and his volume and space is conveyed through a tonal modeling integrated with networks of pattern and fields of flat color. Close attention is paid to the texture of the face and the beard, but for an artist so immersed in training in the West, five years of it, it can hardly be accepted as a complete assimilation of post-Renaissance conventions, considered the handling of linear perspective and the incongruities of spatial logic as a complete imitation of either photographic or painted models. Despite our perception of a volume integrated in space, aspects of shading and shadow and the sharp contrast between the figure and the ground give the impression of a kind of overall illumination. And it wasn't an anomalous piece in Abul Hassan Ghafari's uh, production. These are portraits of Prince Ardashir Mirza from two years apart uh, that attest further to the consistent application of photographs in his uh, pictorial practice. And Talon earlier had shown, uh, she had mentioned the Shams al Imara, the Sun Palace. Uh, we know that up until the late 1900s, that two large scale paintings were installed there that were reproduced from early daguerreotypes as recorded in their inscriptions, but since the 70s they've no longer, they seem to have disappeared. This pair of paintings offers a still more complex layering because it shows interactions across the media of painting, photography and lithography and lacquer. Both paintings manifest a profound attention to the individuation of a subject in casual poses, figures caught in time and congealed for posterity. Ibrahim's painting on the left is an object designed to emulate a photographic object and not just an aesthetic. Consider the oval frame, the modeled outer borders and the uh, caption um, and how the frame crops the subject. Uh, this is a painter who also worked in lacquer. The effect of photography is emulated in the face, hands, and background as sort of nebulous mist of purples and browns. The watercolor on the right, a virtual monogram, a monochrome in black and blue, dramatically opposes the figure against a blank ground. The stark opposition between modes of execution applied to the head and hands and the remainder of the body suggests a fusion of techniques traditionally ascribed to painting and photography. Its artist, Abu Turab Ghafari, was trained as a painter and lithographer in the Dar al-Fanun and produced large paintings by commission as also, uh, and also images for the newspaper Sharaf. Here the subject's Haji Mirza, who was the chief uh, secretary to Zil al-Sultan, who was Nasir ad -Din Shah's eldest son. Now, though these, um, both of these images seem less connected to historical precedent than other examples of painting, mediated through photography that I've shown you. Ironically, they actually force a discussion of history as the long durée, despite their modernity. These lacquered pen boxes of the Safavid dynastic era embody what some art historians regard as the lamentable effects of European post-Renaissance art, whose adoption led to incongruous hybridities, incompletely assimilated pictorial conventions, and the demise of traditional techniques characterized by fully integrated representational systems. Beginning in the 1600s, Persian artists increasingly responded to European art in the form of imported panel paintings, portrait miniatures, and prints to render a style dubbed in Persian Farangi Saz, uh, doing European. There was always Khatai Saz, doing Chinese. Here, romantic couples are set against perspectively structured landscapes sweeping landscapes with Persianate and Italianate architecture. The importance of these objects lies in the evidence they offer for an earlier time in Persianate art when printmaking, another reproductive technology of the image, functioned as an intermediary of representation. 
The Persian artists engage this visual mode in their production of lacquers and other media, here creating jewel modes of polychromy for details of clothing and flowers and monochrome stippling for faces, exposed body parts, and details of the environment. Both objects resulted from a creative process predicated on the use of models, drawings, prints, paintings, finished objects, as well as a habit of freely crossing media. While artists of the Qajar era continued to look back to the art history of the Safavid period for subject matters and styles, partial recreations of the aesthetic aspect of historical objects, and in an imitative intervisual or interpictorial practice enshrined in the conceptualization of Persianate book painting at least since the early 1400s, they also looked to the nearer present and contemporary times. These sources included the visual content of lithographed books and single sheets, newspapers, photographs, photolithographs, chromolithographs, a host of subjects, details, compositional ideas, modes of expression, and the new effective nature of some images, especially portraits of individuals, became available to Qajar artists from imported and domestic contemporary sources. Some of these were translated in the double sense of being moved and converted to the lacquer objects with or without the visual traces of the original medium preserved. It's difficult to reconstruct the visual world of Qajar artists, especially because so few people are interested in it. <laughs> and to convey the staggeringly complex, intricate networks of image production between media, as lacquer objects simultaneously remediated a deep historical tradition of Persianate painting, and waves of new media in the form of prints, lithographs, photographs. General observations of affinities of form and subject between media only go so far to explain the Qajar artists' creative intersection in a 19th century world characterized by the escalating market for commodities and various regimes of mechanical production. Qajar lacquer objects, of course, were not industrially manufactured, but certain aspects of them might be understood to show the effects of the market. These include the range of available subjects infinitely recombined by artists and their apprentices. Subtle changes in the design of objects of related theme or new combinations of subjects constantly reinvigorated a pool of forms and patterned behaviors to produce novel results that continued to make lacquer objects as well as other image bearing objects compelling enough for domestic and foreign buyers to retain an interest in acquiring them. Although this process might indicate repetitive results, the lacquer artist had the capacity to reconfigure prototypes in new arrangements, shift the balance of his palette, supply infinite permutations of details to the basic outlines presented in a design. And all this he did. While this form of production was certainly not new. Manuscript paintings since the early 1400s were conceived and executed in comparable ways. Qajar artists applied it to their great advantage. It might have been a process viewed with disdain by Europeans like de Rochechouart as something akin to the decoupage or bricolage of Victorian scrapbookers, cutting out and excerpting ready-made compositions and fashioning them into new configurations, and low class, Think of the auberge and the wig maker's stores. But it was nonetheless well suited to the demands of efficient production in a competitive market. For industrial art, where the artist was both seller and worker, but in Kajar eyes, a wholly legitimate and culturally approved modality of creation. In aesthetic effect and production, the lacquers are not dissimilar from Kajar paintings that also mediated photographic sources. Kajar works in paper and lacquers offer an interesting parallel to the use of photographs in late 19th century India, where carte de visite and photographs were routinely painted in watercolor, such as in these examples. Any assessment of intersections between mechanical and indexical modes of image production cannot accept the argument that lacquer, that Qajar painters simply emulated photographic sources. Despite the observations of contemporaries that photographs offered objective lessons and techniques of modeling and perspectives, painters did not appear to follow this instruction. 
Photography was assimilated into painting in a manner consistent with practices that had a long historical precedent, a deep structure in the habits of artistic production, whether one looks at court workshops or the guilds of the bazaar. One of the effects of photography and lithography was to reinvigorate the historical practice and format of the painted miniature. The importance of the miniature may have decreased in a painting tradition scaled toward the production of large format oil paintings since the late Safavid and Zand periods, but it continued into the Qajar era through the lacquer object. Far from threatened by the reproductive potential of the new technology, Photography was eagerly assimilated into an arsenal of techniques of production that depended on the use of models. Much like the print culture of the 1600s, the 1800s witnessed the imbrication of photography and lithography in painting. And in doing so, Qajar painters embraced the new technology as a means of forging a doubly indexical and erratic object. After all, their paintings combined features understood to be derived from the photographic index, the trace of a real presence, with the modalities of Persian painting in lacquer or miniature, and united them through the medium of pigment applied by the hand. So it's not a substitution, but a doubling. The real was the construct that remained coded in a network of pictorial conventions and heightened sensations of materiality despite photography's apotheosis and promise as the supreme evidentiary. Now I'm ending. Only a few more pages, Stephen. No, I'm done. Yeah. So as a coda, <laughs> as a coda, I really don't know how to end, but I could end with the observation that although there are numerous uh, reasons to consider the late 1800s as a continuity and not a rupture, as a complex and multifaceted instance of modernity, it's curious that it hasn't been described as such. Or I could suggest a model for regionally inflected modernisms in Iran and India and elsewhere around the globe, but I think people have already done that. Or I could say that as an Islamic art historian trained in the medieval through the early modern periods, that thinking globally is really nothing new at all. It's an ever-present reality of what we do. Or perhaps, and strangely, possibly dangerously, <laughs> that I identify with my subjects, perpetually subject to incomplete representation in a discipline, and also to misprision, despite our best efforts. Consider this. Despite the exponential depth of specialized research achieved in the field of Islamic art history these past 20 years, a consequence of the new global, this is what I think Aruna is really talking about by the global turn, and its embrace, uh, would be Hans Belting's Florence in Baghdad, Renaissance art and Arab science, which is the very reinscription of the Orientalist parameters of Islamic art as quintessentially antifigural and pro-geometry, a fertile breeding ground of image making in the absence of the icon. In considering the criticism of seeing in Islam, Belting invokes Orhan Pamuk's My Name is Red as if it were a source, a novel that is also neo-orientalist in its reinstatement of the arch trope of perspective and the optically real as betrayal. So enough. Thank you.